And now somebody is being held accountable. South Carolina, cop charged after knocking out a black man in an arrest. That warning, but watch. Hey, you done, son? Get that down. Get out. Do you think I'm waistband, dude? We're reaching in your waistband. You think I'm messing with you? You got a gun? You got a gun? You don't know? No. Because you're reaching in your waistband, that's why. Enjoy that little nap. Go right here. Why are you boxing my fist, man? Because you're reaching your waistband. Man, come I ain't on, playing man. with no damn gun, boy. Man, you know me personally. Okay, tough guy. That was all necessary, apparently, except it wasn't. Representative Marvin Pendarvis on the left there, South Carolina representative and attorney, is calling for the U.S. Department of Justice to launch a probe into the Charles County Sheriff's Office after former deputy, former. James Carter on the right assaulted his client, Richard Keithan Duncan. That's a mugshot, former deputy. Lena Black Star has the details. Carter is facing charges, including misconduct in office and assault and battery in the third degree, according to a news release from the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. Fired from his job earlier this month. Former law enforcement official had a series of infractions during his 14 year career at different agencies. You don't say, not just a one off, kind of figure. Per an affidavit posted by the agency, the incident happened October 21st as Carter attempted to arrest the victim after failing to stop for blue lights. What was the alleged infraction though? Duncan's name is redacted. From the document, victim hopped out of his vehicle, prompting a foot chase, but tripped and fell. When Carter caught up to him, you saw it, struck him in the facial area. He was not unconscious momentarily, according to the affidavit. Now the description continued. The defendant then placed his hands around the neck of the victim and moved his body to the ground after handcuffing the victim. While walking to the patrol vehicle, the defendant said to the victim, enjoy that little nap, acknowledging that the victim lost consciousness while he was being struck. WCIV reported that Carter turned himself into custody on Monday, November 27th, but was released on bond. During his hearing, Pendarvis accused Carter of calling his client the N-word during the incident and of violating his civil rights. In addition, he pressed for the release of the ex-officer's body camera footage. This is probably one of the most egregious examples of abuse of power by a law enforcement official I've ever seen, Darvis said for the outlet. Did Carter get Duncan immediate help? No. He sat him in the patrol car for roughly an hour before getting medical attention, despite Mr. Duncan telling the deputy he needed it. And oh yeah, you can probably tell, right? Even if the injured party didn't tell you, and per your police training and what your eyes see, you probably knew this gentleman needed help and you denied that. Carter's attorney, Joseph Caparella, touted his client as a decorated law enforcement officer who deemed Duncan to be a threat, citing his previous rap sheet. And he knew all that at the time. He added that Carter did what he had to do to get home to his family that night safely. Again, this is according to WCIV. Body camera footage shows Carter punching Duncan in the face repeatedly before placing him in cuffs. Duncan's defense team said Carter used a racial slur during the incident. According to WCIV, Carter was fired 20 days after the incident occurred, a delay caused by his supervisor, Tim Carroll. Sergeant Carroll was then demoted and removed from patrol duty for how he handled the case. All right, so that's our first clue that there's a systemic problem here, which is why the representative and attorney is perhaps calling for the Justice Department to step in. 
I am most offended after what was watched on the video by the defense attorney, who I understand you're paid to do a job. The old tugging of the heartstrings. All police are heroes. All police deserve our respect. Trying to get home to their family. You do something wrong with the job, the worst that could happen to you, yes, and as you're fired, which I might be today. Let me think of it. But if a police officer makes a mistake, that person might not be home to his or her family. Doesn't apply in this case. We all see it, okay? Like the commercial. Am I wrong, Yasmin? Yeah. So when I first saw this story, I reread the article a few times because I was like, what was the in, like the inciting incident, right? He didn't stop for the blue. Why would he, you know, like not, he wasn't doing anything. At least it's not being reported that he was doing anything wrong. And then he got out and he ran. And I guess that was enough. So, I mean, the cop didn't, doesn't, it doesn't seem like he was being threatened, like he, there was any threat to his life or to his livelihood or anything like that. It sounds like he started it, like he instigated the incident to begin with. Maybe more will come out um, once the trial gets gets going forward and once the investigation happens and once we get some body cam footage. But it seems like he started it, right? Like he's he provoked this in the this incident from happening. And uh, I don't know if that draws as much sympathy as you know an actual cop who is in a life threatening situation. So it, it's a bit of a stretch. It's a stretch, and we're seeing more and more of these cases. You know how they had these, and I've never been, but they have these things. Couples can do it, or perhaps it's like group therapy uh, employees who perhaps aren't getting along. They go to this place filled with stuff, and they they're able to just break it. They can use a hammer or a bat or throw plates against the wall, and it really gets out your frustration, your your anger to have perhaps lead you to a better place. I mean, I think it all use something like that. Right. And in this case, it seems like, and in other cases too, Mm -hmm. officers who are not judge and jury, even if you have to run after somebody, you're out of breath and it kind of ticked you off, doesn't give you the right to abuse their face and then lie about it. Based on the account there, lied about it. Right, of course. And a lot of these incidents, first of all, are avoidable entirely, but they escalate so quickly, especially when one party has lethal, a deadly weapon on them. And you're very aware of that as the other person in the equation. It's understandable that these things tend to escalate. It's understandable that people react the way that this person did in just trying to run away from the cop who was pulling him over for for not doing anything, allegedly, according to the information that we have. So it is very scary. Um, I know even me, as you know, when I was first learning how to drive, I was taught, you know, if a cop is pulling me over with the lights flashing and I'm not doing anything wrong to maybe call 911 and be like, hey, is this legit, you know? Uh, it is a scary situation for people to be in, especially if you're by yourself, especially if you're a small woman like I am, or if you're a person of color, if you're a black man, definitely, especially in South Carolina. So um, yeah, yeah, we'll Walter see how this plays Scott, out. Shot in the back, and then they tried to plant the evidence. Remember, that wasn't that long ago, okay? Hard to keep Thank track, goodness. though. Right. Thank goodness someone was recording in great peril, by the way. I remember the officer in question kind of peeked over and saw they were, I think, on the outside of a fence or something. But it's ridiculous. And I don't know how to explain it to people who aren't placed as frequently in this kind of fear. I mean, if we have 10 reports of Bigfoot stomping people unconscious, killing people in the woods, and you saw Bigfoot coming at you, would you comply or would you run? Uh, just a question. I'd probably run. Now, Bigfoot would catch me, but I'd probably run because I, we, <laughs> this is what happens, okay, when Bigfoot comes around. It's the same thing here. I don't know what the allegation is, except is that a running from blue lights or whatever, whatever it was? Mm-hmm. And then the, the old thing about the defense attorney, Yasmin, referencing the rap sheet. Okay. I don't know that to be true, but I do. I have a question. Did you know that when you punched the guy out or did you learn that afterwards? Because it kind of matters. Yeah. I mean, if, if he like ran the guy's plates and saw that he had a warrant out for his arrest, then maybe that's relevant information, but it, that's not information that was given. So I don't know if that's 
what actually happened. You know, I don't know if that was the case. And uh, the attorney mentioned it in his defense. He also said that, you know, implied that this, his client, who is a very large man and looks very scary, you know, that his, his life was in danger because the guy was allegedly reaching in his waistband. But, um, you know, the, the victim in this situation seems very caught off guard and seems very confused as to why any of this has happened to him. And really, that in and of itself is traumatic for a person. You know, why did this thing happen to me when it didn't need to happen, right? I didn't do anything. I was just living my life. Um, but again, we'll see. Well, maybe maybe there was some something there. Maybe there's some credence to what the officer was doing and why he acted the way he did. But I mean, we'll see. I'm just not very optimistic. Yeah, I think if there was more, they would surely be parading it. I feel out like that would have been us. included. Yeah, I think yeah. you're right. Very smart. And whatever family member or friend gave you that advice about calling 911, if you ever see the blue lights behind you, good advice. Okay, give yourself all the chances in the world um, just to keep people on the up and up. 